This is Antarctica. It's a continent where we don't belong. In spite of its incredible beauty, the merciless cold, the blizzards and the treacherous terrain make it the most hostile place on Earth. Even these animals, which are specially adapted to the Antarctic, live only on the shoreline and use the sea as an escape route. Not only is this the coldest continent on Earth, it's also the driest. That sounds odd, looking at all that ice. In fact, 90% of the world's fresh water is locked up here. But as ice, it's useless to living things. Man ventured here a mere 160 years ago. Even now, with only the smallest toehold on the place, anyone who comes here has to bring all his food and shelter. This place provides you with nothing. This land and the frozen ocean determine the weather for the entire southern hemisphere. Whether it's going to rain or shine next week has already been decided down here. If the ice cap ever melted, the oceans would rise and drown many major cities. A group of 12 men and women sailed this boat all the way down here because they're worried. They're scientists and environmentalists and they believe all's not well here. They don't feel like leaving it just to governments to make the decisions. It's too important for that. This place shouldn't be a political football. Dr. David Lewis is a pretty incredible bloke. He actually sailed around Antarctica in a tiny 10 meter boat by himself, the only person ever to have made the trip alone. He set up a group called the Oceanic Research Foundation. They're going to Antarctica for three months for scientific studies and to let people know just what's happening there. They're on a shoestring budget and they're doing most of the work converting this 21 meter fishing boat into a three-masted schooner themselves. Dot Smith is a New Zealand farmer and grandmother and Karen Williams, a research assistant married to geochemist Dr. Harry Keyes. Journalist Barbara Movich is writing stories for the Sun Herald newspaper. Her husband, Gary Satherley, is sailing with her. I think we'll paddle. Sydney businessman Dick Smith spearheaded the whole thing. He also guaranteed the money needed to buy the boat. It's taken months, but at last the explorer and her crew are ready to sail. It's the public and business sponsors who've finally given the money to fund the expedition, and with crew's families there on the dock to wish them bon voyage. Paul Ensor and Jenny Bassett are the expedition's biologists. On the voyage, their main task is to keep a log of all the seabirds. A sports teacher from Sydney and a founding member of the Oceanic Research Foundation, Margaret Hunebein. Cameraman director Malcolm Hamilton is filming this documentary. The Southern Ocean is feared by sailors as one of the world's roughest and most dangerous. Some of the crew are experienced sailors, but for others, it's baptism by storm. The winds howl at more than 100 kilometers an hour, 
and the waves are over 10 meters high. Christmas Day comes just before the explorer crosses the Antarctic Convergence, where the freezing currents from Antarctica meet the warm waters from the north. It's a traditional Christmas dinner with a ham and a plum pud, but the galley's so cramped there's not even enough room for everyone to sit down at once. The boat is jam-packed with a year's supplies in case the expedition is frozen in and trapped in the winter ice. No one's got any privacy here and home comforts are at a minimum. The loo can get very chilly in a gale. Dick Heffernan, an experienced Antarctic adventurer, keeps a record of all the weather conditions as well. He turns out to be a great cook. Don Richards, a turf farmer, is a seasoned yachtsman and an experienced radio operator. He keeps the expedition in touch with radio hams in Australia and New Zealand. Gary keeps the diesel engine in tip-top shape. You can't afford to be totally reliant on sail in these dangerous seas. Fresh water's in short supply. Only enough for drinking and cooking can be stored on the boat. For everything else, it's salty and very cold. As they get further south, the temperature drops to below freezing and they see the first iceberg. It was an iceberg only a fraction the size of this one that sank the Titanic. The fierce Antarctic winds and the waves of the Southern Ocean carved the ice into fantastic sculptures. The explorer is going to Commonwealth Bay headquarters of the heroic expedition led by Sir Douglas Mawson in 1911. Like Mawson's, this expedition is sailing three and a half thousand kilometers to their destination. The journey south has taken nearly a month. The sea voyage is nearly over and Commonwealth Bay is in sight. Soon, the hard work and the real dangers of this expedition will begin. Explorer and crew arrive in Cape Denison in Commonwealth Bay in early January, halfway through the Antarctic summer. It's nearly midnight, but in this incredible land, the sun only sets for an hour or so each night. In winter, it's the reverse, with only an hour or two of daylight. The bottom's so rocky that it's impossible to anchor the boat. The explorer has to be tied to the shore with ropes. The howling winds which blow every night push the boat onto the rocks. The crew have to pull her quickly away. While the expedition's at Commonwealth Bay, the boat will still be the main living quarters for the crew, but some will live on shore in the hut erected by the Australian Antarctic Division, making a bit more space on board. Mawson's party landed here in 1911. The hut they built is still standing, but these days it's quite uninhabitable. For Antarctica, 
this weather is a real heat wave with a temperature of five degrees Celsius. Usually the temperature is near freezing. Winds blow almost every day of the year at a speed of more than 100 kilometers an hour. It seems ironic that in this place Douglas Mawson called home of the blizzard, this lot can't even fly a kite. The crew's special thermal long johns and singlets normally protect them from the ravages of the cold and wind. Maybe this heat wave sent them all tropo. Dick Heffernan's fed up with shipboard life and moves in with the penguins. Ryan, hold your life firmly and strongly in your hand and don't let that get out of control and don't let that hit your face. Because you can either put that into your cheek and go right through your mouth or that air can go through there. It would be very easy to be lulled into a false sense of security in this Indian summer. The landscape looks so peaceful and tranquil but a knowledge of basic survival techniques is a must to anyone who's going to venture beyond the shoreline. A hidden crevasse, a steep and slippery slope, or just a sudden change of weather have killed or injured enough unwary adventurers here. Once they've learned how not to get killed, parties move out to have a look at the country around Commonwealth Bay. Crevasses are deep, narrow cracks in the glaciers. Sometimes they go hundreds of feet down into the ice. They might be disguised by snow bridges which can easily collapse under the weight of a man. Antarctic explorers fear these hidden chasms probably more than any other hazard because of the number of lives they've claimed. Fortunately, this landslide didn't end in disaster. But Dot sported the bruises for weeks. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's nothing. If you're looking for fresh running water, Antarctica is a desert. The only way to get it is by chopping through the frozen surface of a lake. Collecting water this way is a pretty chilly exercise. But these beautiful candle ice formations are some compensation. the underwater camera gives us a fisheye view. One of the expedition's main sources of finance was the appeal run by Channel 7 and the Sun Herald newspaper. Everyone who donated received a specially postmarked letter from Commonwealth Bay. Throughout the three months they were away, the main contact with the outside world was by radio, with amateur radio operators. Enthusiasts in Australia and New Zealand religiously maintained daily contact. What about the VK7 boys? What's happening? Pierce Healy in Sydney, call sign VK2 APQ, spent every night for the three months the expedition was away, making sure they were okay and passing on personal messages. In total, he spent more than 200 hours at the mic. It was often frustrating. Because of bad weather or atmospheric disturbances, messages had to be relayed through other stations. But in spite of the problems, they never lost contact. That's really lovely to hear. Um, Paul's just outside floating around in the water at the moment, and I'm just about to be. Um, give Paul's mum, Paul's love, and mine too. How are the boys? Over. Boys are here running around the back garden at Pearson. Best of love to everyone there in Hawara. Penguin hugs and kisses to Thomas. Confined conditions. Stop her. And Pierce relays a telegram of congratulations 
from the Australian Minister for Science and Technology, David Thompson. <laughs> Although life here seems peaceful, every animal faces a battle to survive. They struggle with the fierce environment and other animals that are their natural enemies. The skewer gull, a scavenger, likes nothing better than to supplement its diet with a penguin chick. In fact, it follows the penguins to their nesting places in the spring to prey on the unguarded eggs or babies. Jenny and Paul take the chance to observe local wildlife. While it's still fine, Jenny and Paul join Margaret and Karen and visit the Makellas, a group of islands in Commonwealth Bay. The seas are calm, but two inflatables make the trip as an added safety precaution. The cold can be so intense here that the spray freezes, creating some strange and amazing ice formations. Penguins, which seem so clumsy on land, literally fly through the water. Powerful flippers and wings make them some of nature's fastest swimmers. Look out, the humans are coming, the humans are coming. Ow, oh, bloody rocks. They ought to keep an eye out where they build their nests. The McKellar Islands are a pretty uncomfortable place for people. Rocky, barren, windy and cold. But it's just that which makes it the right place for a penguin rookery. The winds blow away the snow, leaving the stones exposed ready for the penguins to use in nest building. The sea here doesn't freeze too early, so penguins have time to escape before the long, dark winter sets in on the continent. The penguins' environment is harsh, but their bodies are brilliantly adapted to withstand it. Even though their tubby shape seems funny, it helps stop them being blown away in blizzards. Penguins are naturally curious birds, and aren't afraid of people. The reason for this visit is to map some of the penguin colonies on these islands and count the chicks in the colonies. This gives an accurate idea of the total population. It's much the same as taking a census in a city of people. The penguin colonies are neatly divided into little streets and paths, so each suburb is counted and then checked off. Each person carries a small counter to record the numbers. 25,000 of daily penguin chicks are counted in the three days. And just one very out of a chin strap penguin. The information collected here will be passed on to the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, an international body which coordinates work done by individuals and nations. Data such as this provides basic information about the penguin population. Now more research can be done to work out how the activities of man, or natural changes, might affect these penguins. One, two, three, yes, four humans. Now we'll have to do an environmental impact study. As a defense against predators, penguins never go into the water altogether. They tip one fellow in first. If he's eaten, they'll find another launching place. The Waddell seal is the only mammal to spend winter on the shores of the continent. It keeps warm by staying in the water, but is always hard at work gnawing blowholes in the ice so it can breathe. Scientific information is hard to get in these icy wastes, 
but it's vital to the ecological future of the continent. At Cape Denison, Harry Keyes carries out the geological program, a study of how far the ice extends, the temperatures, and the level of salts in the lakes. Harry estimates the changes in the ice margins by comparing them with the remarkable photographs taken by Frank Hurley 70 years ago on the Mawson expedition. Nowhere else on this continent has man got data that spans such a long time. And because Commonwealth Bay hasn't been inhabited, we know the changes here must be due to natural causes. If the ice round the shores of Antarctica is either shrinking or expanding, that's telling us something very important about our weather. If the ice is advancing, there will be a drop in our temperature. Even a drop of half a degree Celsius would mean a lower yield for crops in the southern hemisphere. It could mean a world famine. Harry travels between the two extremities of Commonwealth Bay to find the places where Hurley took his historic photographs. Many of the sites are hard to find because of the tremendous changes caused by the winds, the immense pressure of the ice and the rock falls. But in some places it's possible to make a comparison. This is a photo taken by Frank Hurley in 1912, 70 years ago. We're looking at the same rocks, the person sitting on the same rock, same ice cliffs. At the present time, this ice seems to have come forward more, and another change is the sex of the person sitting here as the female taken today. To date, the expedition's been terribly lucky with the weather, but suddenly it gets worse. Disaster is about to strike. The winds peak at 130 kilometers an hour, and the temperature plunges to minus seven degrees Celsius, making a chill factor of 30 degrees below freezing. These are the dreaded catabatic winds, intensely cold, heavy air which roars like a tornado down the slope from the plateau. It's difficult for the parties to go ashore to work, but they keep at it, inching their boats along the lifeline from ship to shore. Harry, Karen, Jenny and Margaret are making their way to shore when their tiny craft is swamped by crashing waves. David Lewis takes decisive action. Within seconds, he and Dick are there with the inflatable. At this temperature, the people in the water can only survive for a few minutes. Jenny, wearing a special flotation suit, is able to work her way back to the boat along the safety line. David and Dick, wearing no special protective clothes and with bare hands, work frantically in water that's one degree below freezing to pluck the other three to safety. Harry and Karen, wearing only conventional wet weather gear and now suffering from hypothermia, would have lasted only seconds longer. Karen is blue and unconscious, and Harry is near collapse. This shattering experience. Especially seeing Karen getting uh, further and further away. Floating off into the wild blue. The best thing that I thought was David grabbing the back of my neck, saying, get in, Margaret, get in, Margaret. Well, that was marvellous, because my beanie had come down right over my eyes, and I hadn't been able to see what was going on no, anyway very incredible. well. It seemed so, you know, you, you went panicking, and I knew that I had to keep moving. What happened was I, I reached up for the rope, and we were hanging on the rope, and trying to go hand over hand to the shore. And when I did that, all my clothes rode up and with them sodden and wet. I just couldn't breathe around my neck, and so I ended up dropping the rope. I thought those big boots were full of water and really pulling you under. Yes, well, that was what I thought pulling me under was my heavy boots full of water, when they're three to... sizes too big. Year 1911, 
Mawson's party constructed this hut as the base for the exploration of the then completely unknown sector of Antarctica that lies south of Australia. Here they wintered in the place that Mawson termed the home of the blizzard. In the hut today, with the remnants of the things that made up these men's daily lives, I can almost feel their presence here 70 years ago. Mawson described their life here in graphic detail in his book, Home of the Blizzard. Our hearth and our home was the living hut, and its focus was the stove. Kitchen and stove were indissolubly linked, and beyond their pale was a wilderness of hanging clothes, boots, finesco mitts and whatnot, bounded by tiers of bunks and blankets, more hanging clothes and dim photographs between the frost-rimmed cracks of the wooden walls. Noise was the necessary evil, with the subdued melodies of the gramophone mingled with the stirring of the porridge pot and the clang of plates deposited none too gently on the table. The rise and shine of the night watchman and a curious assortment of catcalls beating on pots and pans and fragmentary chaff. In the background was the swishing rush of wind and the creaking strain of the roof. Jobs in the hut were the elixir of life, and a day's cooking was no exception to the rule. It began at 7 a.m. with a brief intermission between lunch and afternoon tea, and continued strenuously until 8.30 p.m. Cooks were broadly classified as crook cooks and unconventional cooks by the eating public. Throughout the winter months, the work went on steadily, even after dinner, and the hours of leisure were easy to fill. Some wrote up their diaries, played games, smoked or yarned. Others read, developed photos, or imitated the weary cook and went to bed. Parties in the spring set out to explore the coast, to study geology and the seals, the penguins, magnetism, the aurora, a whole number of scientific studies. Mawson himself, with two companions, sledged far to the eastward over dangerous crevassed ice. Then tragedy struck. Ninnitz with his sledge, his dogs, and the load which contained nearly all their food disappeared down an enormous crevasse. A race for life began for Mawson and Mertz. They were forced to kill their sledge dogs and eat them. An unexpected hazard was vitamin A poisoning from eating husky dogs' livers. Mertz succumbed. Mawson was desperately ill on the brink of death with still 170 kilometers to go to reach safety at this hut. This dark memorial commemorates the supreme sacrifice of Mertz and Ninnitz. The sick and starving Mawson struggled on, upheld only by his indomitable spirit. The exhausted Mawson arrived at the ice cliffs overlooking this bay just in time to see Aurora disappearing across the horizon, sentencing him to yet another year in what he termed this accursed land. Mawson's expedition laid the foundation for much of Australia's claim to Antarctica. In 1931, he returned here and laid claim to King George V land on behalf of Britain. Proclamation in the name of His Majesty George V, King of Great Britain, Britain Ireland, Ireland, the British Dominions beyond the sea, Emperor of India. Whereas I have it in command from His Majesty King George V to assert the sovereign rights of His Majesty over British land discoveries met with in Antarctica, now therefore I, Sir Douglas Morton, do hereby proclaim and declare to all men that from and after the date of these presents, the full sovereignty of the territory which we have discovered and explored, south of latitude 64 degrees and as far as the South Pole, vests in His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors forever. Captain Mackenzie raises the flag.
given under my hand at Cape Denison on the 5th day of January 1931. Signed, Douglas Mawson and the Master of the Discovery. Yet today, the hut of Mawson, one of Australia's greatest heroes, lies rotting in the ice and snow. Soon the ice will destroy the interior and its precious contents. The exterior is already badly weathered and the wood is splitting from the winds and bitter cold of this forbidden continent. There is little David Lewis's modern day expedition can do to save the historic landmark, but they hope that at least the public will become aware of just what we are losing. Nailing the door shut won't save the hut, but at least it will stop even more ice and snow getting in. Their work's done, it's time to move on. The achievements of the expedition so far are a triumph. Few people thought that the explorer would be able to get into Commonwealth Bay. Even David Lewis thought the pack ice might stop them. But they've been to Mawson's hut and carried out the first stages of their ambitious geological and biological programs. Stillwell Island is the next destination, and after that, the Mertz Glacier. Man has never set foot on some of these remote islands. They provide a perfect sanctuary for bird life. The Stillwells are a rocky group of islands, an ideal breeding ground for penguins, Antarctic fulmers, storm petrels and other seabirds. It's getting late in the season. These baby penguins are losing their down and gaining adult plumage. It's rare that anyone gets the chance to film these graceful birds. The fulmers are one of the most beautiful birds in Antarctica. Most penguins spend the winter away from the continent, living in the warmer water of the sea, but they'll be back for the next Antarctic summer. Only a few hours can be spared in this rocky paradise before the expedition leaves to continue their journey to the splendors and dangers of the Mertz Glacier. Glacier is a slow-moving river of ice, pushed downwards and out towards the sea over thousands of years by the ice cap behind it. It may move only a few centimetres a year, although some move much faster. This is the Mertz, named after Mawson's companion who perished near the head of the glacier. Theoretically, one day, Mertz's body could emerge at this end as the ice breaks off into the sea. The glacier is more than 80 kilometers long. It is fed continuously from the falls of snow and sleet. But it's also decaying with great chunks breaking loose each year. These are the icebergs, pieces of ice up to 15 kilometers long and as high as 50 meters above the waterline. Below is six times as much, a total height of nearly half a kilometer. The seas are calm enough now to sail the channel between a giant iceberg and the glacier. At any time, these great cliffs might shatter, sending millions of tons of ice into the sea. The caves on the side of the glacier are formed by the continual force of the waves against the ice. The calm weather provides an opportunity to explore but without knowing it, this party is taking a tremendous risk.
the next day, this cave had entirely disappeared. Icebergs form in an infinite variety of shapes and sizes. All of them are layered, each layer representing a year's growth from the fall of sleet and snow. In this one, the ice has been compressed, removing all the air, which gives it a bluish sheen, highlighted by the polishing of the fierce winds. During winter, this whole sea freezes, forming a solid sheet and doubling the size of the continent. A layer four meters thick can form in one winter. In a few weeks' time, this will be frozen solid and totally unnavigable. Many animals live on pack ice or use it as a resting place and a base for access to the rich seas. These are emperor penguins. They're over a metre high and weigh about 25 kilos. They're the largest of the penguins and the only ones to spend the whole year on the Antarctic continent. Through the long, dark winter, they protect their eggs and newly hatched chicks from the fierce cold. For them, this weather is a heat wave and this manoeuvre is a way of getting cool. From the Mertz Glacier, the expedition sails west along the coast to Dumont de Ville, the French scientific base. This part of the voyage takes a week, with a constant lookout needed for icebergs or equally dangerous submerged bergy bits. After almost two weeks at sea, Dumont de Ville promises some home comforts new faces, perhaps even some French cooking, and a chance for scientists to swap information. Bonjour, monsieur. David greets Robert Guillard, three times the commander of this base, and with a record 35 Arctic and Antarctic expeditions to his credit. Food is of supreme importance on any Antarctic base, an antidote to the monotony of life. The French take good care of their men and their visitors, serving two five-course meals as well as breakfast every day. A special occasion like a birthday calls for something really fancy. In return for the French hospitality, a party is held on board the Explorer. More than 40 friendly Frenchmen crowd on board. <laughs> Antarctica determines the weather in the southern hemisphere. Scientific observations are terribly important because they can help predict short-term and long-term changes. At Dumont de Ville, Meticulous weather observations are kept at the base and remote weather stations collect information on what causes the catabatic winds. A weather balloon goes up every day and is tracked by radar. The data is recorded and deciphered at the base. The expedition scientists swap valuable information with the French who are studying krill. Krill is a crustacean that looks like a tiny prawn. It makes up the entire diet of many Antarctic animals and is a vitally important part of the food chain. Whales are now threatened not so much by hunting as by the possible large-scale harvesting of krill. It is vitally important that scientists find out how much can be harvested before it begins to affect these rare and beautiful animals. Icebergs are a possible source of water for the parched deserts and dry areas of Earth. Although it seems a little crazy, Many scientists believe that in the future, icebergs will be towed from Antarctica to areas needing water, places like South Australia and the Middle East. But to make this come true, we need to know far more about icebergs. How quickly will they melt when they're being towed? Are they likely to turn turtle? Will great chunks fall off, making them useless? How will they be affected by ocean currents? Could they be rigged with sails? Dr. Harry Keyes designed a special study to begin answering some of these questions. 
using simple, cheap technology to measure temperature, the level of salt in the water and dyes to follow the movement of currents, Harry collects vital information. He finds that the melt rate of icebergs is greatest around the waterline and that this could make them very unstable to transport. But once the problems of towing icebergs are overcome, the possibilities for their use are endless. Not only could they be used to green the deserts of the world, but they could even be used to generate electricity as they melt. These experiments, though simple, are an important beginning. They're cheap because the expedition concentrated on keeping costs low and technology simple. The scientists aren't paid for their services. Even today, private individuals can make exciting and innovative contributions to the knowledge of mankind. Like the other countries that have bases in Antarctica, the main purpose of the French at Dumont de Ville is to carry out scientific research. The research done in Antarctica is enormously important. Strange sounding studies like upper atmosphere physics and ionospheric research are adding to knowledge of possible energy sources and are essential to long distance radio communications. Biologists here study the mutual dependence of animals and their way of adapting to the freezing temperatures. Psychologists study the effects of isolation. But bases such as these are very expensive. To have two scientists living in Antarctica, 24 backup people must also come. Dumont de Ville is not a particularly big base, but every scrap of food, all shelter and equipment, most of it very specialized, has to be brought in from outside. Here, most of the waste is recycled. Because of the intense cold, waste won't decay. And in this environment, you need strict precautions against alien microorganisms. Even the potato peels are sprayed to prevent the growth of fungus. And the only thing that can't be recycled, the metal wastes, are dumped in the sea. David Lewis leads a different kind of expedition. While they can never hope to match the sophisticated research done on the bases, their simple technology makes other projects possible. Their biologists study an enormous range of wildlife on land, at sea, and on the pack. This carnivorous leopard seal can skin a penguin with one shake of its head. An oceanographic ship would cost a minimum of $10,000 a day. Using the explorer as a base, Harry Keyes is able to spend days scooting around icebergs collecting data. But perhaps more important, is that this group isn't here under a national banner. They're not interested in territorial claims, and they certainly don't want to drill offshore for oil or harvest krill. But they do want to find out how these activities will affect the environment, and they want to make sure people all over the world become involved in the decision-making. It's our future that's at stake. late February, and like the penguins, the explorer must leave before winter.
In spite of the excitement of heading for home, there's regret in saying goodbye to French friends. journey home, there's still a lot of work to be done. One of the major tasks of the trip has been organising enough appetising food for 12 hungry people. Food that isn't perishable, but that's nourishing and good to eat. The experience gained on this expedition will be invaluable in planning for the future. One of the joys of life at sea is the constant procession of animals that swim with the boat. These hourglass dolphins are only rarely sighted. And it's time to think of facing civilization again. Now, I do feel that uh, the success has been absolutely beyond any expectation I ever had and I think this isn't the end of the road, I think it's the start of further expeditions and perhaps a new era of the small, privately financed, dedicated Antarctic expedition. Hey Dick, what are you looking forward to when you get to Sydney? Well, most of all, I'm looking forward to seeing a very much missed lady friend. Ice cream. Fried chicken and ice cream, they've been haunting my dreams for about the last two weeks. Um, I'd like to have a shower every day for the next next month, I think. I'm going to have a bath and a beer, not necessarily in that order. You're washing the hair? Lots of cream, some strawberries, I think. We've been a, uh, a dry boat for the last couple of weeks, so perhaps I might buy myself a drink. I'd like lots of fresh water and lots of fresh fruit and a horizontal bed. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. it's just some peace and quiet and some gracious living. Paint and I'm looking forward to a good ship on a toilet that doesn't roll. <laughs> <laughs>